After earning a master's degree from DTS in 1973, he founded Eventel, an evangelism training ministry committed to presenting the gospel clearly and simply. He later earned a doctorate from Gordon-Conwell Seminary in Boston, and received an honorary doctorate from Cairn University in Langhorne, Pennsylvania, where he also had attended college. He's spoken throughout the United States and in approximately 20 foreign countries in a wide variety of venues. He's a regular guest lecturer in evangelism at the Word of Life Institute in New York and Florida, and he serves as, as a visiting faculty member here at Dallas Theological Seminary. He and his wife live here in the Dallas area. They have one adult son. Uh, Larry, thank you for your faithful proclamation of the gospel. Would you come challenge us this morning? Would you welcome Larry Moyer? Well, thank you, and it's an honor and delight to be here this morning with all of you. I always enjoy having Dr. Bailey introduce me because I know he'll say something nice. And when you travel as a speaker, you get every introduction under the sun, but they're not always nice. I tell people one of my favorites was up in Michigan for a week-long conference, a pastor up on opening night. What he actually wanted to say to people was, no, Larry came here on Saturday. He'll be here all week. We're looking forward to that. Then he'll be leaving us next Saturday. But it was a pastor who had a reputation for getting tongue-tied in the pulpit. And sure enough, he introduced me. What he said to the packed house was, Larry came here on Saturday. He'll be here all week. He's leaving us next Saturday, and we're looking forward to that. <laughs> so I sincerely appreciate his all three kind of production. But if I were to title what I want to pour out my heart to you about this morning, I would call it How to Argue About the Gospel. How to Argue About the Gospel. And if you have your Bible, may I invite you to take and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'd like to start reading at the 22nd verse. Allow me to read those few verses to familiarize you with them. And then follow me as I read. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I like to start reading at verse 22. 2 Timothy 2 and starting at verse 22. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape the sneer of the devil, having been taken captive by them to do his will. You have observed the same thing I have. We are living in a day whether it be pleasant or unpleasant, it seems like it's almost impossible to find two people who agree on the same thing. Whether it be education or employment, money or marriage, parenting or politics, everybody seems to have their own opinion. For example, let's take the simple subject of parenting. Most people would agree with a recent study that revealed that if your parents did not have any children, then you will not either. But where they disagree <laughs> is on the subject of having children, displaying children, and educating children. First of all, when it comes to having children, some feel fertility is a matter of choice. Others feel it's a matter of chance. Some are the opinion that you ought to find out ahead of time what your child is going to be so you can then prepare. And then some feel you ought to wait till it's born because when it's born, you're going to be so excited. You're going to be like the young father running down the hospital hall saying, it's a father, it's a father, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. <laughs> At the same time, they disagree on the subject of disciplining children. You know, how far do you go in disciplining them for doing what's right and wrong and rewarding them for doing what's right? I've heard the best combination of parents is a father who's gentle beneath his firmness and a mother who's firm beneath her gentleness. But where do you draw that line between what's firm and what's gentle? Some would look at us raising our children and be of the opinion, you're being too firm. Some would watch us raising our children saying, you're being too gentle. And then when it comes to the subject of educating children, everybody agrees you start in the cradle, not the classroom. But where there are differences of opinion, it's what all that classroom ought to be. Should it be public school, private school, or home school? And when it comes to subjects so delicate as sex, there are different opinions, 
as a when you tell your child what he needs to know before you find out what he already knows. <laughs> Dr. Henriks loved to tell the story of the boy who said to his dad, where did I come from? And the boy said, well, the stork brought you. And the boy said, well, dad, where did you come from? He said, well, the stork brought me. He said, well, dad, where did grandpa come from? He said, well, the stork brought him. He said, well, dad, where did great grandpa come from? He said, well, the stork brought him. And the boy said, I finally figured out what's wrong in this family. And the father said, what's that? And the boy said, we have not had a natural birth around here for four generations. <laughs> <laughs> but frankly, none of those are what matters the most because they all concern things of the passing, not of the permanent. A thousand years from now, it will not matter how many children you had and did they know and follow you. Instead, what will matter is were they introduced to Christ and did they know and follow him. Because matters of the permanent always take priority over matters of the passing. And for that reason, I do not know of a better question for you to ask anyone than the question, do you know beyond the shadow of any doubt that if you were to die, you'd go straight to heaven. But if you ask people that question, you find there are differing opinions. You say he's a great savior. They say he's a great teacher. You say the Bible is without error. They say it's full of mistakes. You say there's a heaven or hell, and they say there's neither. And it's only a matter of time before discussion degenerates into debate, and a debate degenerates into argument. And you soon find out you may have some questions for them, but they also have some questions for you. And as I travel with evangelists, and I ask people the question, what holds you back in evangelism? One of the top three answers I always receive is, I'm just afraid I will not be able to answer their objections. And you soon come to the opinion that to be effective in evangelism, you have to have the mind of a philosopher, the wit of a debater, and a skill of an attorney. Well, one thing that has grieved me for years is when it comes to ecclesiology, we say, what does the Bible say? When it comes to eschatology, we say, what does the Bible say? When it comes to pneumatology, we say, what does the Bible say? When it comes to evangelism, we throw the Bible aside and say, let's talk about evangelism. And frankly, I don't know of any paragraph in the Bible that better tells you how to respond to those who object to your message than 2 Timothy chapter 2. And what I love about this paragraph is he makes it so clear that anyone can understand because as Paul writes to Timothy about how to be prepared for every good work, he tells him how to respond to the person who objects to your message. And since Paul is writing a pastoral epistle, I take it that the one that objects to your message may be a Christian resisting the truth or a non-Christian resisting the gospel. It may be a Christian who is walking away from God or an unchristian who's never come to God. But in so doing, he tells you how to argue about the gospel. And in so doing, he tells you there are two things you ought to avoid and the antidote for each one. Because if you're going to know how to argue about the gospel, you have to know what to flee and what to follow. Now, if you notice, the first thing he says is, flee youthful lust. Look what he says in verse 22. Flee also youthful lust. Now, as far as we can determine, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. Timothy was between 37 to 42 years old. So why would he say, and flee youthful lust? Because he probably not think about Timothy's age. He's thinking about his inexperience as a pastor because he had not been in that position very long. And when he said, flee youthful lust, he did not talk about the appetite of sex. Instead, talk about the temptation every young pastor faces to be pretentious, to display his own wisdom, and to talk about the kind of person that backs someone in the quarter and tries to make a fool out of him. An attitude that so many times permeates evangelism. And while Paul is saying, flee youthful lusts, flee that temptation to thank God, display your own intelligence, and that attitude that is contentious, and he says, flee you for lust. Now, let's face it. Every single one of us have times when we are tempted to be proud. More time like to admit, we are tempted to go up in the morning, stand in front of a mirror, and sing, how great thou art. <laughs> but and often, all it takes is the right person to put us in our place. One time, there was a man who brought his boss home for dinner. 
and the boss was very proud for him, boastful and dominating. And all during the meal, the man's son just sat there and stared at him the whole meal. And finally, the boss said, son, why are you staring at me? And the boss said, and the, and the, and the son said, because my dad said you're a self-made man. The boss said, that's right, I'm a self-made man. And the boy looked at the boss and said, well, if you are a self-made man, why did you make yourself like that? <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, all it takes is the right person to put us in our place. And what Paul is saying is, pride and ministry cannot coexist because prideful people are not effective and impacting other people for Christ. And so he said, for that reason, I'll avoid youthful lust. Instead, he says, here are four things you need to do. And look what he says in verse 22. Flee youthful lust, but pursue righteousness. What he means by that is everything right in actions and attitudes, both what you do and how you do it, ought to honor the Lord. Then he said, not only righteousness, but faith. That means dependence upon God. Because if they are going to come to Christ, you cannot do it through Christ. Christ is to do it through you. Because you are not the power, you're only the instrument. And then he says in verse 22, love. He talked about the kind of thing Christ had in mind when he said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. I said, love your enemy, do good to the person who hates you. Someone has said, to love a friend is natural. To love an enemy is Christ-like. And then he says in verse 22, and peace with those who call on the Lord have a pure heart. And the reason he says that is because you don't change the way you act when unsaved people come around. Instead, the way you are with Christians in particular will be the way you are with unsaved as well. And so he said, if you're peaceful in your relationship with Christians, you'll be peaceful in your relationship with anyone, anywhere, even those who oppose your message. And what he is saying is, those who oppose your message do not need your pride, they need your humility. They don't need your immaturity, they need your maturity. And so for that reason, flee youthful lust. But then he goes and says a second thing to flee, and in essence, he repeats what he just said. Because Paul knew repetition was the art of learning. One time, a mother was asked the question, why do you tell your child the same thing 20 times? And she said, because I found 19 just doesn't do it. <laughs> And Paul knew repetition was the art of learning. So he says the same thing he just says, but says a whole lot stronger. And the second thing he says is, play foolish and stupid arguments. Look at what he says in verse 23. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Now, that word ignorant disputes means uninstructed, uneducated, stupid speculations. Now, please understand, he's not talking about people. He talked about the argument because God never talks about people and derogatory way. But the reason he calls them foolish speculations is because they come from people who don't know what they're talking about. One time there was a cynical professor that said, I'm going to ask you one question. If you can answer it, you can forgo the final exam. Here's the question. If a boat flows five miles downstream, while a crow flies four miles across an open field, while a sparrow flies 10 miles counterclockwise, how old am I? One student said, well, uh, you'd be 44. And the professor said, you're right, how'd you know that? And the student said, because I have a brother who's 22, he's only half crazy. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, he's saying they come from people who don't know what they're talking about. Because the Bible says, the natural man does not understand the things of God. They are foolish to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But notice Paul's emphasis is you avoid the argument, you don't avoid the person. And the reason he gives is in verse 23. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. You know what that phrase generate strife means? One argument leads to another argument, 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 and guess what? Leads to another argument. And all you've had is not an experience of evangelism. All you've had is a series of arguments. And Paul says, avoid 
foolish and stupid arguments. Instead, he says, now here's what you need to do. And look what he says in verse 24. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be, and then he said, gentle to all. That means approachable in your demeanor. Not sarcastic, not scornful. The kind of person someone's not afraid to walk up to and disagree with. Gentle in your approach. One time a woman walked in a supermarket, and a man walked in with a bag, and she very gently said to him, now, you're going to have to let me staple that bag shut or leave it here at the desk. He became irate. And she very gently said, please don't misunderstand, but we don't want you to be accused of shoplifting, and therefore you either have to leave the bag here or allow me to staple it shut. He threw that bag at her, and she stapled it shut and very gently handed it back to him. Several moments later, he returned. He apologized for his behavior, and she had the chance to introduce him to Jesus Christ. He's saying, be gentle. And then he says, and secondly, he said, be gentle to all, able to teach. That means a sincere desire to bring a person to a knowledge of the truth. To impress them with his intelligence, not with yours. It's not the kind of spirit that said, if you have any smarts, you already know this. But instead, if you have a few moments, could I explain something to you? a sincere desire to lead people to the truth. And then he says in verse 23, in verse 24, patient. Someone has defined patience as the ability to count down before you blast off. He's saying when you're working with someone who's opposing your message, you better count down before you blast off. It takes patience, 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 patience. And one reason is because you always have to keep in mind that you don't know all the facts. One time there was a family who lived in a three-story house and an attic. And that was where they stored things they only used about once a month. Whenever a storm would come through, the wind wind currents would go through that attic and make that attic door slam back and shut and back and open and shut and open and shut and open and shut and open. And when father of the family was a man who demanded absolute obedience from his children. And one time the storm was approaching, he said to his son, that storm is going to wreak havoc in the attic. You go up and slam that attic door shut and lock it. And the boy said, but wait a minute, Dad. And the dad said, don't wait a minute, me. Go up and slam that attic door shut and lock it. And the boy said, but Dad. And the dad said, don't but Dad, me. Go up and slam the attic door shut and lock it. And so the boy went up, slammed the attic door shut and locked it. A few minutes later, the storm struck. Shingle blew off the roof. Limbs blew off the trees. Lights been going off. The father walked in the kitchen looking for his wife. And he said to the son, where's your mother? The son said, that's what I was trying to tell you. She's in the attic. <laughs> Sometimes you don't know all the facts. And that is why you've got to be gentle able to teach, patient. And I could wrap everything this paragraph is saying in one sentence, and that is, in responding to those who oppose your message, use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. In responding to those who oppose your message, use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. And the reason is, the issue is ultimately spiritual, it's not intellectual. Look at what he says in verse 25. In humility correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant the repentance so they may know the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by them to do his will. That word repentance means to change their mind, and that phrase, that they might come to their senses, means that they might sober up. And it refers to a person who is so intoxicated by Satan, he doesn't even know what he's saying. And what he's saying is, only God can cause them to change their mind. Only God can make them sober up. And that's why I've been saying for 42 years, there's not one verse in that book that says, bring the lost to Christ. Not one verse. The Bible says, bring Christ to the lost. 
because only he can bring loss to Christ. Only he can make them change their mind. Only he can make them sober up. And that's why in responding to those who oppose your message, use a humble attitude and not a hostile argument. You see, our problem is that so many times we focus on the argument. God focuses on our attitude. We focus on what has to come from our lips. God focuses on what has to come from our life. We focus on the argument. God focuses on the one who's arguing. And in responding to those who oppose your message, use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. And I am not denying there comes time for debate. I am not denying that it's good to know how to answer objections. But whatever you do, you have to remember what Paul said to Timothy and respond to those who oppose your message. Use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. They don't need your hostility. They need your humility. They don't need your pressure. They need your patience. And so in responding to those who oppose your message, use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. And I have found in traveling evangelists, the truth of that paragraph is so clear. Because I have met people across the United States and the world who have led people to Christ, who are in such opposition to their message, but they didn't do it with a hostile argument. They did it with a humble attitude. And in responding to those who oppose your message, use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. I recognize your students of Dallas Seminary. I recognize you know the Bible a lot better than most people out there. I recognize your students right here in this room that could back anyone in the corner in about five seconds. I'm telling you on the authority of the word. When God talks about how to argue about the gospel, he makes something very clear. Use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. And respond to those who oppose your message. Use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. Could we say that together? (laughs) And responding to those who oppose your message. Use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. Say it again. And respond to those who oppose your message. Use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. I tell people God gave me two spiritual gifts. The one's evangelism, the other's repetition. (laughs) Let's say it again. (laughs) And responding to those who oppose your message. Use a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. One time true story. There's a person who came to Christ, and with that new convert excitement, he wanted everyone to know Christ died for you. And so he spoke to everybody he could. Again, true story. In the community, there was an unbeliever who was noted for being just that, an unbeliever, who loved to outwit his opponents, parade his intelligence, and make a fool out of as many Christians as he could. Although the new believer felt very inaccurate, he decided, I've got to go see that man. He went to see the man at his permission, and the new believer started talking to the man about the gospel. It took about two minutes for the unbeliever to reduce the new convert to smithereens and act him like, talk to him like he was a totally ignorant fool. New believer's lips start to quiver. Tears rolled down his cheeks. He said, please forgive me. I have wasted your time. I don't know how to explain it to you. But I just love you. And I just want you to know the same Jesus that has transformed my life. Please forgive me for wasting your time. Don't bother me showing to the door, showing me to the door. I'll find my way out. With that, he left. He went to his house, and we walked in. He said to his wife, I'm going to my study, and I just need to be alone. I've had the most difficult witnessing experience I've ever had. I guess I'm just not good at this stuff. I've just got to spend time with the Lord. 
So he went to study and got on his knees before the Lord. About one hour later, there was a knock at the door. The wife answered it, and there stood this unbeliever. He said, I'd like to see your husband. And the wife said, well, he's had a difficult day. He's really requested that he be let alone. Now is not the day. And the unbeliever said, oh, I, I think he'd love to see me. And so she directed him to the study. He walked in, he said, new convert. First of all, I'm sorry for the way I treated you. I want you to forgive me. I want to know God. You're God. The new believer said, I don't get it. You made it crystal clear. You did not want anything to do with me, anything to do with my God. And the unbeliever said, yes, but I could not answer your last argument. New convert said, what do you mean you couldn't answer my last argument? And the unbeliever said, it was when that tear rolled down your cheek and you said, you love me. I said to myself, how can someone like you love someone like me? On behalf of the lost, on behalf of the Savior, and on behalf of your own obedience to Scripture, I beg you, in responding to those who oppose your message, use a gentle attitude a humble attitude, not a hostile argument. They need your patience, not your pressure. They need your humility. They don't need your pride. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, forgive us for time we don't look at the scriptures because they give us all the guidance we need if we just follow it. And I pray for my brothers and sisters here. We might learn. We might know how to respond to certain things people say. But Lord, you focus on the objector, and we focus on the objections, because you're in the people business. You refocus on the argument, and you focus on the one who's arguing because you're in the people business. Lord, help us to be in the people business and help us respond the way God, through Paul to Timothy, said to respond. Again, for your sake, for the sake of the lost, and for the sake of our own obedience and reward when we see you face to face, we ask it. In Jesus' name, with thanksgiving, amen.